there. <coughs> I am shooting a video about um, killer angels and um, in this video I will be explaining how the advanced game works and uh, maybe later in this video or, or more likely in a supplementary video I will um, go through an example of the play. Now I, I've just started playing the first scenario in the advanced game which is basically the attempt by um, the Confederates to capture the town of Winchester here. Now the uh, basic game, all the scenarios that um, either start with Winchester captured or the, the campaign game starts or after that, the campaign game starts with it captured, the first scenario starts with it captured. So the advanced game introduces a situation before uh, the um, basic game occurs. Now. Right from the outset, I should. Um, there's a few things I'd like to say. One, just objective about the um, game itself, and and the second, sort of set th about um, my responses to it. So the first thing to note in the advanced game, the two, uh, two of actual changes to the rules. The first one is that each game turn now lasts a day. Whereas before in the basic game, every game turn lasted two days. They now last one day. And the reason for that being is that movement is not so much slower, but more uncertain in uh, the advanced game. So um, you might be moving as far in two days of two turns of the advanced game as you move in one turn of the, the basic game. Um, it's... I also kind of gives some indication of what it, the, the advanced game is like and that most of the points in it are additions to the basic game. So it goes into kind of finer detail. So, you know, in a sense, I'm splitting a turn into two sections into one day each. It means you can there's more sort of detail going on in each turn. Um, and then the second major difference is in scouting. Now, in the basic game, any time... Uh, opposing units were in the same hex, um, you cut to the contact routine. And at the top of the contact routine, um, the forces within the hex are revealed to each other. Um, now, uh, in the basic game, you actually, if you uh, remember, let's have a bit of a close up. So um, you've got... Now, uh, I'm playing solo, so I've turned them over, but essentially this is the situation you would have in a, a basic game. So, um, well, in fact, in basic and advanced game, is that all the units are unknown. So all you have is that you know that this is a cavalry unit, this is a cavalry unit, headquarters. I'll just get a bit closer so you can see that better. So you can see this is a cavalry headquarters. It has that little flag. Similarly, that is um, a infantry headquarters because it has a little flag. And where do we have? There's a, a standard infantry unit and a standard cavalry unit. So you know and where you have infantry, where you have cavalry and where you have headquarters of each, but you don't know what they are. So you wouldn't know as such that this is um, the Army of Northern Virginia. For all you know, it could just be um, a divisional headquarters. Any units below divisional size do not have headquarters. So if you have a um, detached brigade, no, sorry, divisions don't have headquarters. So that's either uh, an army or a corps. If it's just a division, it doesn't have a headquarters. So for example, over here, we actually have Longstreet's Corps. So that's the headquarters unit. Uh, but a bit further north here, we have a cavalry brigade. So it actually has a leader counter with it, but there's no headquarters. Now uh, that, that leader counter, leaders of divisions comes in and in the advanced game. But anyway, back to the point I was trying to make is that um, with all the units being hidden, more or less hidden like that, um, the contact routine becomes very important because if these two units were in the same hex, you would turn 
um, them over and you would know, okay, you've got a cavalry headquarters there uh, of the... And, Um, cavalry headquarters and it's a core as the XXX denotes. Similarly, um, turning over the opposing unit will show you that, okay, that's the dot indicates that's just a um, picket and not like a division or some such. But in the advanced game, um, if these two units are in the same hex, uh, there's no auto that you go to the contact routine, but there's no automatic um, seeing of each other. So you could actually escalate or move to a skirmish without knowing exactly what force you're up against. If the force that is moving in is scouting, then that gets to see what the other um, units are. But it doesn't get to turn them over. So you'd get to see, okay, there's Pleasanton with a headquarters. So that's probably Pleasanton's cavalry um, corps headquarters. But you wouldn't actually turn it, the headquarters over to check. It could be headquarters of, well, in this case of the cavalry, there's only one. But it, it, um, for example, down here, um, you would say, okay, that's there's a headquarters in that hex and Sedgwick, Sedgwick is with it. But we don't know if that's the Army of Northern Virginia's headquarters or um, now commanded by Sedgwick or 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 something else. So in, in, in actual fact, in reality, you know, you would know that the if if Hooker was in the hex. So, for example, we've got. Let's go a bit closer. So you've got two um, Union headquarters. And if you could see below that, you'd see that that's Hooker. So then you would really know that that is the the Army headquarters. Sorry, but I have, I'm holding... The, I haven't got enough hands to focus it in. I don't have autofocus. Um, and that one, you would see that Sedgwick is commanding it. But you wouldn't necessarily know if he's commanding just a division or a um, core. Hang on, no, that doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah, think it through. Yeah, you would always know, okay, but basically, um, based on the commanders underneath, that's really going to tell you if it's, um, that it's a core rather than an army. Um, but the point being, you, you wouldn't flip this. So there might be a situation, depending on like leader deaths or promotion, when you know who's leading, but you don't know exactly the unit that is in there, which core it is, for example. And you, you as in the basic game, you wouldn't know the strength. that You wait until that is declared in the combat, and you can always declare less strength than you actually have there. But anyway, the point being is that it's only the scouting unit that will get to have a look at who's in the hex. Um, so any unit moving into a hex, um, unless it scouts, it doesn't know exactly who it's up against and who it's up against doesn't know exactly who it is unless they get, there's a pause and they do nothing to each other and one of them scouts the other in between. So those are the two biggest changes. The rest, as I, as I say, is more sort of, um, additions and, and extra details rather than outright changes. Um, now, the second point I wanted to raise was my change in my relation to the game, and that is that I was very enthusiastic about this game. I found it, find it a very interesting system, and I was thinking I might actually get up to play the whole campaign game. Now, you can actually play the advanced game with some of the campaign game rules in it, and that would be adding things such as, well, quite a lot, um, but lots of things like off-map boxes, um, reinforced, different types of reinforcements, promotions. Um, well, you do get promotions in, in the advance, but anyway, some extra things. Um, to do with organisation and, and stuff like that. But, um, and I thought I'd do that after playing the advance game for a while, but actually um, I'm coming to the point where I'm kind of, I, I, I'm done with the game. Not in the sense that I, I've played it and I'm done and I will, or will, would let the game go. I mean, I practically my games are categorised in in uh, about three categories. And one is the um, 
done and one and done category, which is that I play the game once and I go, okay, that was great. You know, it's fine for me to play it. That was interesting. Or maybe, the, oh my God, that was terrible. But it's more inter- often that is it interesting. And I'm like, but I know that I don't want, I'm not interested in that any further. And I will let the game go for trade or for sale. Um, then there's another category, which is I play it once and I go, oh, that was interesting. I'd like to play that again sometime. And um, that's where this one is lying now. Because I play, I've actually spent a lot of time with it. I played um, four or five of the basic scenarios. And in between, there's a lot of time spent punching the counters, organising. I mean, you have to, in the advanced game, you've got a lot more organisation. So just the setup for this scenario took, uh, you know, like a whole evening's preparation, making sure I got everyone in the right tracks and all the counters in the right places on the map and so forth. And then, of course, the, the um, clipping takes a long time because there's a lot of un- a lot of counters. So every unit has um, at least two counters for it, one for the track and one for on board. And then people like the leaders, they actually have... Um, They have dummy counters as well, which I'm not actually going to use. That as a that's an optional rule, but yeah, no, it's at least two, and so, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of counters, so a lot of preparation, and then of course reading the rules and trying to suss out the rules as well. So, I've spent a lot of time on this, and I haven't regretted any of that time, but I'm now at the point where I'm kind of like, okay, I I get this game enough that I know that I like it, but I'm not that interested at the mo- enough at the moment to spend a lot of time with it. I think that's partly because of the backlog of unplayed games that I have. I'm, there's a large part of me that just wants to go through them. I want to play every game that I have at least once um, to understand where I am with it. Now, there is another category of um, games that comes to me, which is the one where I played it once and I go, oh, this is interesting. I want to play it again and again and again. You know, that goes on for a while until I've had enough. And obviously I put that away. It never lasts forever because, you know, I want to play other games, not just one. Um, And this isn't in that category at the moment. It was a few weeks ago when I was playing the basic game. And now I started the advanced game. I I think it, it's what I feel is I'd like to play it again. But, you know, if I have like a, an undisturbed week when I can really get into it and I don't really have to be doing anything else, i.e. that mythical... T- time when you know I retire and I'm free (laughs) um but that's the kind of hope but so that's where I am with this game so I think this is going to be the last player I have and that's also partly instigated by the fact that in the advanced rules there's actually no campaign game in the basic you can play a whole campaign which um is could involve you kind of you know Lee's Lee has um starts in Virginia, he wants to move up, go into um, Pennsylvania, create havoc, perhaps threaten Washington. And so it's, it's more or less a whole campaign. It's sort of 22 turns, I think it was. Um, you're actually offered double that um, on the turn track. Um, but that's, and that, those are, that isn't used in the advanced game. The advanced game rules just present a whole series of scenarios. For, for example, scenario one is this, second Winchester, so the capture of Winchester. Then scenario two starts where that leaves off, with, um, and it's called Lee Moves North. So you can feasibly play second Winchester and continue into the Lee Moves North scenario. But then that scenario ends on um, the 24th of June turn. And then the next scenario, three, me takes over, starts on the 28th game turn. And that one lasts until the July the 10th turn. Then you've got scenario four, which is Gettysburg the second day. That begins on July the 2nd. So you see they're not exactly into leave. Then you have Lee's retreat beginning on July the 4th. Um... And scenario six, the pursuit south of the Potomac, beginning on July the 14th, continuing to July the 30th. And that's all the six scenarios in the advanced game. So they're all interesting scenarios, interesting portions, and maybe lasting up to 17 or... um, Yeah, maybe that one's the longest, the last one's the longest, 14 game turns. 
Right, read days. Yeah, so 17 days at the longest. Um, and the, the, But they're just all portions of the historical campaign. And so that is essentially what happened. I think they... The, the leaders, the, the designers after saying, OK, this is the basic game which has a campaign in it, which is a, is this kind of satisfying um, beginning and conclusion. Um, we're, we're not going to offer that in the advanced game, because if you do want that, that is going to be the campaign rules, which is a step up again. And that actually offers you 90 possible turns. Um, often, as I understand it, skimming through the campaign rules you wouldn't use all of those but it starts on june the 1st ends on august the 31st so it's um the whole sort of summer long and it even starts before second winchester so it starts with lee's build up and hooker's build up and, and the sense i get from a lot of the beginning turns is it would just be lee sort of moving out here calling up reinforcements from places Hooker um, asking for various reinforcements from different departments around Washington, preparing and assembling the forces before you would actually get to then Lee's first sort of move. Uh, probably, I think it's nearly always going to take, because it just makes sense in the geography and, and Lee's objectives to move um, towards Winchester, probably then to Harper's Ferry, and that from there on into Maryland and Pennsylvania. You do have the option, of course, to try and invest Washington, but... Um, if you're not moving, um, it's easy. then obviously Hooker eventually is going to be able to jet pounce on you. And with the full might of um, Hooker or Meade or whoever's in command at that point, uh, Union Army, it's going to be a tough fight for the Confederates to come out well. Um, so, you know, really the game is for, um, for Lee to move around and try and pick off bits of um, hookers uh, of the, the Union Army and um, spend the summer. I One thing is taking the fight out of Virginia. The point being they, they give is that then the Virginian harvest is on the last and allows to grow so you know there's enough food for the people and so forth, raising the morale of the South, taking the army to the Union rather than um, the Confederacy, and then the other thing is to threaten Washington, you know, create consternation, and if there is ever a chance, you might take Harrisburg, Baltimore, and um, Washington, but probably that, that will never happen. Harrisburg conceivably, but Baltimore and Washington just too well defended. While as a Confederate you were banging on those doors, the Union Army would would for sure meet up with you, and, and there would be one hell of a fight, and depending on how well the Union Army was um, uh, converged, you know, if it's the different elements were, were all together, they might have vastly um, superior numbers and even artillery. Um, but in the advanced game, that isn't so. You don't have a campaign, you just have parts of the campaign. And I was a bit disappointed with realising that. I think if it had given a campaign without going to the full campaign rules, which are... It's a whole nother booklet of stuff. You can just see the extra headings. There's a lot of case numbers. Now, um, a lot of this book, well, some of this book, so that's the end of the rules page from pages 60 to 75. So 15 more pages of rules and then some designers' notes and so forth. But, you know, that's still a lot, a lot of uh, text to take in. Uh, I wasn't willing to go that far. Um, there's another step up again. So I was, I, at this point, the, at this second step, I couldn't. I think I would have played the, the whole campaign at least as far until we saw who was winning or who wasn't. If I whether I would play to the end of it or not, and and it's not available. So um, that contributed to my decision. To think okay, because I just want to try the game out. I um, mean, you know, I don't. I don't feel at the point at this moment that I want to play it to exhaustion of its possibilities. Um, I'm happy to leave those possibilities open for another time. So, um, without more ado, let's get on to the extra rules. So the first thing that we get, uh, 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 above what I just said, in the advanced game, are brigades and regiments. So now um, you can, in pickets and, and, and now um, 
actual pickets of a few men before in the basic game it was sort of un undiagnosed whether it was just a few men or, or a regiment or even perhaps a brigade a whole brigade in the hex um a brigade albeit with only one strength point a regiment with only one strength point in in this game now pickets have no strength points so they're purely for scouting and screening but now you can detach brigades and regiments a brigade can have up to eight strength points a regiment only up to three but still you know that could be a significant speed bump or delay uh, especially at um you know at roads and bridges um at crucial points and the next thing is, is the union player can create grand divisions and on, there are tracks for um a left center and right grand division so that is essentially um that the union player can split off one to three core from his main army so he starts with what uh one two one two three four five six seven core in in the union army of the potomac and if he likes he could split some of it off in a grand division now it could just be one core it could be two or three as well and when that happens then um there's also it also has implications for leadership which i'll get into a bit uh then um then there's also what's called army assets so certain brigades and regiments are labeled potomac or northern virginia so they're actual army assets that are um, perhaps brigades or things like engineers pontoon bridges um and uh supply wagons that uh, well supply you get yeah supply is another thing but and pontoons engineers and so forth that are immediately subordinate to the army commander not to any um corps in that um, you also have an interesting brigade, the Union Provost Brigade, and that brigade, uh, stragglers come to this game, the Provost Brigade, it's kind of like a police unit. You can use that to help. Uh, in actual fact, actually, that only, I'm just checking the rules, that's just a rule in the campaign game. But like I said, you can use bits and bobs of the campaign game rules in, in the advance. So you can use that to um, tr reduce stragglers. Um, rounding up naughty boys running away um, then uh, they have the change to the pickets in the advanced game which I have mentioned and now you come to the leaders so now um, each division has a two star leader so previously we had three star leaders for the corps and the four star leaders for the armies now you have two star leaders that are divisions and I showed one earlier up here so you had um, you got Jenkins um, with a cavalry division. In fact, that's a cavalry. Yes, it's actually a cavalry division. I think it might be effectively a brigade, but nominally a division for the terms of the game. I don't know the exact nomenclature for the Confederates at the time. Um, so uh, another thing of note is that new commands can open up either through leader casualties, which you didn't have in the basic game, and also for the creation of Union Grand Divisions. So if the Union creates a Grand Division, they need to move a corps commander to be in command of that division. Now that's going to leave their cor his corps without command. So you get a whole slew of extra leaders. And there's, although I've punched out loads, there's tons left in the box. Um, some of these are actual units, um, so divisions that can be split off. Or, or regiments and brigades and some are leaders that um could be come from the leader pool to fill um opened up commands so there's command appointing that costs action points um then there, there's a slight change in the issuing of orders in the advanced game it now has to go through a chain of commands so whereas before um lee could issue an order to um one of Longstreet's divisions, you're spending an action point to move it, for example, or to entrench it, or to help it cross a river, or something like that. Now that has to go through Longstreet. So, um, uh, so Lee would activate Long. If he wants to move one of Lee's divisions, he has to activate Longstreet, and Longstreet then has to activate the division. Now, if a leader is unavailable for whatever reason, maybe through a casualty. 
um, it still has to go through that chain of command and you just spend an extra action point for the missing chain of command. So uh, it, if necessary, Lee could command a division directly, but he's still going to pay extra action points for it. And because of that, they don't have more action points in the advanced game. That is another reason why you have to split the um, game turns into two, because you're spending action points quicker in the advanced game than in the basic. So there's a chain of command like that. Um, there's also another thing is that um, Potomac spheres of influence. Now, uh, you have um, so you have the Union Army of the Potomac here. Then you have the Department of Washington here, Department of the Middle here, and up there, up north, you have the Department of the Susquehanna. Now that's not actually activated at the moment. That would become activated later, um, depending on movement and so forth. And reinforcements would start filling it up. But um, otherwise, these two departments, they're separate from um, uh, the Army of the Potomac. So Hooker and Ormido, who is in command, cannot affect anything. They cannot move any of these the units under that command. And that's quite crucial because, for example, in um, this in the first scenario in advance, Second Winchester, the Department of the Middle actually commands all the, U the Union units around here. Uh, and I'm not sure who commands these. I think, yeah, these are just pickets, so anyone within range can command them. And the Department of Washington, it just commands those few units there. But what that means is that these hooker cannot move these units. So, and um, the depart uh, and Schenck, who's in charge of the Department of the Middle, has an initiative value of one. So, um, uh, a reaction range of zero, etc., etc. So he's very slow in moving any of his guys. Mainly, they're not going to move much. And um, the Winchester in the in this first scenario, the the point for the uh, Confederates is to take Winchester, not lose a depot. They have depots here, here, and here. Um, and also they have a depot here with um Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. You cannot move depots, so um. So they must take Winchester, Winchester, not lose a depot, and not lose more than 10 more strength points in combat than the Union. So um, that behooves the Union to reinforce Winchester. There's just a, yeah, it's just a weak division there under the Department of the Middle. Now, Schenck's going to be very slow, if at all, to be able to reinforce that, for example, with Kilroy, who's up here with another division at Martinsburg, which do isn't a crucial place in any means, except perhaps, you know, as a railroad junction. But the point being, he could bring that there to reinforce, but he, he probably won't because of his initiative and um, action point range and so forth. It would be very slow doing it. So Hooker wants to take, um, ask for a direct command of one or two, both of those units. So that comes under... Um, Potomac command sphere. Now, if oh, sorry, that's slightly different, but it's kind of linked. So, if the command sphere is if Hooker is within a certain range of any department, um, he can issue orders to that departmental co commander or, or departmental units. Um, the other point being that he uh, he can ask to take command of their units, but that costs action points and it happens during the politics segment. It's a political issue. It's not purely an action point expenditure within the uh, movement um, turns. Um, so then the next change is to unit initiative role. So in the basic game, independent units had a basic initiative of two. In this, they have a basic initiative of zero, so they're not going to move at all unless Except that, but the Confederates have one. So pickets, for example, will have, for the Union, they'll have zero base and one for the Confederates. But then you get plus one of their cavalry. So Confederate cavalry pickets or perhaps brigades or, or regiments that are independent out of any command radius, um, like a, a lot of these Union ones that are, will get one. And plus one if they're a picket and plus one of their Confederate regiments, brigades south of the Potomac. So what that tells you is that independent units... They're more likely to move with their cavalry uh, and even more likely to move with their pickets. If they're brigades or regiments, they're more likely to be standing still. Um, another point is uh, telegraphs. So um, 
hooker can uh, send a telegraph along a rail line to a unit along a rail uh, on that rail line, which means that um, as long as the unit is on a re connecting rail line, it extends his command radius in that fashion. Um, the Confederate uh, commander, so Lee can also do that, but there's uh, not so much opportunity. There's essentially just this one rail line down here. It does mean he can command Trimble, um, which he couldn't in the basic, because Trimble's, Trimble over here um, is on a rail line. So Hooker could send him a telegram, say, come up here with some of your chaps, for example. Um, then uh, movement. Now movement's a bit different in that you have, in the basic game, headquarters could move one hex basic, all other units two hex basics. In this game, headquarters and infantry divisions can only move one hex basic and all other units two. So, so headquarters has a core, so that's, a core has a headquarters, so a whole core is only going to move one hex basic. And infantry divisions, even on, on their own, only one hex basic. But if they're cavalry divisions, they will have two hexes and everything else, i.e. brigades and regiments and pickets, can move two hexes basic. Then you get the road bonus. But that does mean, that, again, it's a little bit slower moving, generally, even the small um, smaller units. So you need that s split of the turn. Um, and then the other thing is is march markers. This is quite different. So in the basic game, you moved in your movement phase, and then you could move again and force march, and you just had a, a marker to show that you couldn't force march two turns in a row. In the advanced game, you get different markers. So some moves give you a march to marker. So for example, if your headquarters is moving difficult terrain or crossing a ford, you immediately go to march two, which means you cannot move again in the that turn at all, not even in reaction, not even in forced march. Your movement is done. Otherwise, certain other moves you will get um you get a march plus one marker. So for example, if you go in fact only if you're going entirely along the road in your first move, you'll get march plus one. Any other type of move will be march minus one. Now what the plus one and the minus one mean is that if you want to move again in the turn, perhaps in reaction to opponent's move in their turn or in your force match, you have to move against the leader's movement rating. Now that didn't come in to the uh, basic game, but we see here Hill on the top left has a two rating. If we have a look at Lee for comparison, he has a six rating. And then let's just have a quick look at Hooker. He has a two rating as well. Now what this means is that you add the minus one or plus one number to that rating and try and roll equal to or under it on a d6 if you're going to move again in that turn, reaction or perhaps a forced march. Uh, which tells us already a big difference is that Hooker is, um, unless it's moving along a road with a plus one, then he's only got a 50% chance to, for example, move in reaction. If he doesn't move in his own turn, he could immediately move in reaction to um, a Confederate move, but then he'll get a, a marker on him if he wanted another reaction. So, um, again, that means you need that split in the days because you're not definitely, units are not definitely going to move a second or it perhaps even a third, potentially a third time in, in a, in a day. And there is a, a total limit that you can, the total you can move in any game turn, i.e. one day is seven hexes, which would be, uh, what's that? 350, 350 kilometers. <laughs> That's, I'm not right, is it? Must be 35. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, whatever that is, that's the maximum you can do along a road, essentially. Um, so, and, and then also there's the scouting. So if you're moving as a, and scouting, then you get a March 2 marker immediately. So you, if you scout, you won't be able to do anything else. You won't be able to react or force March in the rest of the turn, but you will get that opportunity to scout. Um, then there's attrition, which wasn't in the basic game. So uh, you have a handy little attrition chart. 
I'll show you here. And so depending on the number of hexes moved, uh, one, two, three or four hexes, which would be the maximum tour, you might take, if you have no march markers, so you haven't moved already in the turn, um, you would take none, one or two uh, strength points attrition. If you have a first march marker, so minus one or plus one, um, you could you would take one at least um, uh, strength point loss and attrition. Now that is adjusted depending on the leader's movement. So uh, some leaders like Pleasanton, for example, has zero movement. In fact, he might actually be a minus one. So you're even on a no march, he's always going to lose a straggler, basically, um, unless he is cavalry. So that would cancel each other out. Or you are a picket, you get a minus, and there's that accompanied by the Provost Marshal Brigade, minus one strength point. So you see, attrition comes in, and so um, it, which is interesting because in in the game I've already played um one turn, and essentially um Lee detached Long Street. Long Street is off marching up here. I think he's here already now, and. Uh, He's lost, I think, four strength points of men just in doing that. Um, now, it's not kind of modified according to the size of the unit. So, you know, even if you're a three strength point regiment or a 19 strength point division moving along, um, you're still going to lose the same amount of strength points, which might not seem very agreeable, but that's just the way it is at avoiding further complications I guess and essentially I, I think that's fair enough you you're really detaching regiments as garrisons and outposts rather than as marching units you know that are going to be um, marching long distances on their own to achieve major objectives and you, you might yeah I do see a problem that I suppose they would just move slowly um, to stop um, any um, any attrition um, slowly and cautiously, which you, I guess if you move at your regiment on its own, moving fast through enemy territory, a lot of men are going to fall out because you're moving so fast. You know, like sore feet and um, hunger and or 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 desertion, getting fed up. Um, then uh, the reactions is are changed a bit. So instead of reaction just being a basic role against the leaders, it um, has modifiers according to the size of the force um, on each side. And um, if they were moving on a road or in rough, so it's easier to react if it's moving along a road, harder if it's moving through... Um, rough or woods, obviously, because you might not, you know, can't quite see them so well, if if at all. Um. Then there's uh, oh, and we have wagon trains. So I haven't got supply yet, but we do have wagon trains. So these are wagon trains on the um. Uh, mark uh, on the strength tracks, and if you. Um, move in reaction you have to leave your wagon train behind now that is very interesting because we had like whole armies moving in reaction whizzing around uh, along roads um, in the basic game in this you can do that but you'll, you'll leave your supplies behind so what it does tell me is that a lot of the rules won't come in a lot of the special things rules and that's what I kind of th felt was being hinted in the basic game a lot of the game is just going to be little movements and maybe a, a bit of scouting here, a bit of scouting there and not like spending all the action points every turn to maximise your opportunities and kind of scurrying around the board everywhere. More likely, uh, um, suddenly there will be very important things where, OK, now we're going to leave behind our wagon train here, move off the road or something or, or react to, th to that. We've got to get there and uh, take that place or meet that hopefully meet that army and then that battle would ensue and I think that's great because I think that um, is how the campaign would have been so I like that I really like that rule about having to abandon your wagon trains if you're moving in reaction it's only core that have wagon trains divisions could go without but then 
but we'll come to that in the supply. Um, so then combat, how is combat different? Well, it's the same table and everything as the basic, which is nice to know. Uh, same modifiers and so forth. The only differences are is that uh, leaders can become casualties. They might be just out of action, wounded, or um, actually killed. Um, now, that's if it's the active leader, and you can actually choose, in basic game, two leaders could add their combat factor. In the advanced, it's three. And that is interesting because what it shows is that it's the active leaders you, you roll for. So you could have Lee, say, in a hex, um, in a battle hex, but he's not going to be active. So there's no danger of him becoming a casualty. And this is something which I feel a bit odd, is that then that means he cannot add his um, combat ability, which is a whopping 10, I think it is. No. So what that says then is that the battle, it, it depends on his subordinates. Maybe it is realistic. You know, Lee's job was to get the right men to the right place at the right time. And from then on, that battle is more the tactics of his subordinates. So Longstreet has nine. He would be in there. He could become a casualty. If you want to add Lee's ten, Lee could actually become a casualty. Same with Hooker, Meade. And, and they give a replacement chart which goes all the way down to McClellan possibly taking over the army of the Potomac uh, because of um, casualties higher up. Um, so there's that. Then there's also broken forces. So before you just carry on the battle till you just saw fit here, if you lose 50 strength points, including you might have reinforcements coming in, you add them in and you know factor that in, uh, an army would break and then it has to withdraw. So no army is going to stay until it's destroyed. Uh, another thing is uh, with entrenchments. Um, if a division builds entrenchments, it can fit any a division below into it. If a regiment builds entrenchments, you cannot fit a division into it. So that requires scratch paper bookkeeping off, off map. There's no marker distinction for that. And then the other thing is artillery. So here the um the artillery in basic was just considered factored into the strength points of the various divisions and so forth. And perhaps, you know, like the uh army commander's battle rating. Um but here are uh, the Union because 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 they had an actual artillery reserve unit, it's considered an army asset. So if that is used, it actually gets a, it, it just it is a modifier of minus four on the uh def the um confederate attack roll so it comes in as as a modifier in combat and only for the union side so that's how battles different then rail cuts are hard, uh, handled a bit different in the advanced game in that you can do a deliberate or a hasty cut a hasty cut is always repaired at the end of the game turn no one needs to go there to do it it's just you know piling logs or rail cars or something on the track and so local forces can move that pretty quickly at, at the end of a day but it could cause disruption within that day um deliberate rail cuts now take a lot longer and a lot more um action points to restore and in fact they can also be considered destroying bridges so if you do a rail cut per se over the potomac or the rappahannock in this case um, you, it would actually be destroying the bridge, and that's going to take even longer. And I think, I won't go into all the details, but uh, a union engineer, you know, you've got the engineer units, must spend five game turns repairing a minor river bridge and 15 repairing a major river bridge. So in effect, that means a major river bridge cut is permanent in the course of any advanced game scenario. In the campaign game, that's going to be 15 days out of possible 90, which it will be out. And that is provided you have the engineer unit there and um, it is, you're spending action points to, I think you have to spend them each, each turn, each day, again, to keep repairing it. Yes, each game turn, the qualified leader has to spend two action points. Um, then you also have pontoon bridges, so engineers can throw a pontoon over a river. And then there's also 
the Confederates have their engineers, um, but brigades and large units can repair engineers on their own in the Confederate. The unions will actually require engineers to rep repair rail cuts. So they don't actually, yeah, no, sorry. So the Confederates don't have their own engineer units. Uh, you can also destroy road bridges in the same manner. Um, then we come to communications, which is a bit different. So in the basic game, there was no sort of line of communications necessary. And this, each of the respective armies, not the cause and so forth, that might be detached, but the armies themselves have to um, trace a line of communications confederates down to Richmond from here, here, or Staunton. And um, uh, the Army of the Potomac to Washington from wherever it is. So if that is cut, then you... Uh, lower the leader's initiative rating by two and you have the action point value. Um, so you can see that that's going to severely hamper either unit. So that's going to add another big factor in that you know, if Lee's moving into the north, um, Hooker might just move to cut his line of communications rather than try to futilely chase him down. And that might cause Lee to have to come back to restore his line of communications for Hooker to try and pounce at that point. I can see that could create Hooker's opportunity. Um, so that's an important factor. Although Lee could continue, it was conceivably on half action points and initiative um, because he starts off quite nicely with those, but Hooker would have more action points too and so could be gathering resources quite quicker. And then we come to the politics, which I mentioned before, the department activation, reactivate on their own if a Confederate force comes within the commander's reaction range, which, for example, in the case of Schenck is zero, so Baltimore's not going to do anything, that's why the department of the middle is centred, until, uh, until a Confederate force lands in Baltimore, um, or uh, Hooker moves within range and then is able to instruct. And then Union Reinforcements, you have a table for rolling on. You can spend action points um, to find out, um, depending on the size of the unit that you are requesting, um, whether you yes, you're given it, no, you're not given it, and no, you're actually going to lose action points the next turn to indicate the time spent wrangling um, uh, with um, Washington or the department and or the department about it. Um, okay, and that's a campaign game. So you can spend action points to make that benefit. Note that Hooker has a minus six possibility. So once Hooker's gone, Meade get, uh, gets more chance to have to request and reinforcements. Then there's another thing is that if ever... Um, uh, Washington is threatened, so a Confederate corpse or larger with than six hexes or ten hexes by road, Washington is considered threatened. And a um, Union player must interpose a corpse cor or larger between the threatening unit and Washington or request freedom of action. So if um, Lee's threatening Washington with somebody, uh, Hooker has to detach a core, put it in between, or he rolls on the freedom of action table. And depending on if it, it's Hooker who's a radical, or if it's Meade by now um, commanding, or perhaps even a Democrat leader, because it could be another leader, but both of those have died in combat. Then you would roll on this table, um, have some modifiers. Again, Hooker doesn't get a very good chance. Um, Blah, 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 for freedom of action, say yes, you don't don't worry about that threat, we'll deal with it. No, you have to deal with the threat. So then you because you hadn't, you're requesting the freedom of action, you would uh, get I think it's three you'd give three victory points to the opponent, or no three victory points opponent, and you um lose that many action points the next game turn again for wrangling with Washington, and you could even be removed. So Meade's never going to be removed. Hooker might be removed. 
as a political decision. Um, and then this, and that's the end of the advanced rules per se. Then there's what they call optional, but they kind of really are the advanced rules. It's just, you know, do you want this much more? One is the dummy rules. No, so I don't, didn't want those. I'm not playing with those, but essentially um, you, every leader has a dummy and you get some other dummy, uh, like regiments and so forth that you can put down um, to confuse your opponent. Uh, the leaders can move on their own as an optional rule, so you could scoot across from division to division. Then in battle you can place units in reserve and then bring them on in a later round um, and attempt to flank with them. So that just gives a kind of like a mini tactical opportunities in battle where you might not declare all your forces at once and so forth. Um, uh, uh, but uh, that unit might be reserved, uh, might be delayed, so it might not come in exactly when you want to. Uh, and then we have supply. So now this is where the wagon trains come in. So we have depots. Depots are essentially um, have supply lines 12 and 15 hexes for Union Confederates. Um, and they can keep units supplied. Um, I think infinitely with those until they are destroyed um, or the Confederates can actually capture Union supply but not the other way around. But then you, ha if you can't trace supply to a depot you can draw it from a wagon train but the wagon trains have seven and five supply points for the Confederate and Union respectively. Um, you have to be within three hexes of the core that is carrying that, that wagon train. And I haven't actually had to use it yet, so I'm not okay with the rules. Yes, if you, you immediately resupply in range of a friendly depot. Okay, so wagon trains obviously um, can move, they move with the core and can be destroyed. If you have neither of those opportunities, um, you can try to forage. So it, you must be more than three hexes from the nearest enemy unit and occupying clear terrain hex, then up to eight strength points can draw forage supply. If otherwise you're out of supply, if you're out of supply, um, and if you're out of supply at the end of the game turn, you roll 1d6 and lose that many strength points. And each game turn, you're out of supply, you add another level, so you would add that number to the um die that you rolled. Uh, then we have um, here we have a kind of like a paralysis rule for Hooker if he's close to Lee or a dummy Lee and then a special rule for Hunt who's the Henry Hunt the Union Army Artillery Officer so um, he can add a nice combat bonus but he could become a casualty. And that is the end of the advanced rules. So you can see the major differences are the kind of extra finesse in moving um, and command and that we have a, a daily turns and um, it's harder to see exactly what your opponent is until you actually engage him in combat in any one hex. So that's nearly an hour for this video. I think that's quite enough time for the video. And if anyone's got through this and or would like to watch the example of play, I'll put that up as a separate video um, alongside this soon. So there we go. So just last point to note is that in the advanced game, even these off map boxes do not come in. That is, uh, just, as I intimated earlier, part of the actual campaign game. Um, and I, I am interested in that campaign game. I'd like to see how that drawing reinforcements because it's this is what the game does. It really gives you the sense of the commander's dilemmas like 
and anxieties. I need more forces. Where can I get them from? And, you know, I have to go through Washington to get it or or Richmond. And, and uh, will I have enough available? And at what time am I going to get them? And, you know, I not want to make this operation now. I've got so much, so many days left in the summer. Can I have them before the end, please? It would be interesting, although... And it does say at the beginning of the campaign game rule, but be warned, this this increases a substantial amount of time and record keeping to play. So um, that would be another year, another another day. But for now, um, just a, a bit of a replay of uh, the Winchester scenario to come up. 